I'm Sarah Middleton of the Digital Preservation Coalition. Welcome to the first in a short series of programmes which will introduce our Digital Preservation Awards finalists, reminding you of their innovative and inspiring work before we reveal the winners this Thursday, World Digital Preservation Day at 12 o'clock UK time. Each episode will take a look at one of the awards categories and the incredible people and projects who've been selected as finalists for each. Today, we're going to be looking at the Software Sustainability Institute Award for Research and Innovation. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Neil Chu Hong and Joanna Fleming. Hi, my name's Neil Chu Hong and I'm director of the Software Sustainability Institute. Hi, I'm Joanna Fleming. I'm the Digital Curation Specialist at the State Library of New South Wales. Hi, Neil. You are, or the Software Sustainability Institute, is the sponsor of this award and you are the vice chair. Uh, could you say a few words about why it was so important for your organisation to sponsor the award? Thank you, Sarah. The digital preservation community relies on the ideas, effort and enthusiasm of many different people and organisations. And the Software Sustainability Institute is proud to be a part of this community, supporting advances in digital preservation. We're therefore delighted to be sponsoring the Digital Preservation Award for Research and Innovation. Uh, Joe, can you remind us about the criteria for this awards category? What were the judges looking for when they selected their finalists? The award for research and innovation celebrates significant technical or intellectual accomplishments which practically lower the barriers to effective digital preservation. It is presented to the project initiative or person that in the eyes of the judges has produced a tool, framework, standard, service or approach that has or will have the greatest impact in securing our digital legacy. Thank you and uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about each of the finalists in this awards category. Now, would you like to introduce them for us? Three nominees in this category are Levels of Born Digital Access. When we talk about preservation, what we're often referring to, either explicitly or implicitly, is access. As one of the six functional entities defined by the OAIS reference model, access is literally foundational to digital preservation. As archivists, we are responsible ethically and to our user communities to provide access to our holdings. Access is universal. It is a common denominator across all institutions, regardless of their size, resources, or collection types. Access is central to our work. In short, it is the whole point. But in spite of the critical role that access plays, there's little agreement about what this looks like in practice or how this might be implemented from institution to institution. Without a set of practical guidelines or baseline requirements, we're left to our own devices to interpret what is good enough and to devise a strategy that will meet our users' needs. The DLF Born Digital Access Working Group created the levels of Born Digital Access to fill this gap. Inspired by the levels of digital preservation, our levels provide benchmarks to guide policy and decision-making in the form of a tiered set of format agnostic practices to facilitate and improve access to born digital materials. The levels cover accessibility, description, researcher support and discovery, security and tools. Each area is organized into three levels of progressive complexity. The document provides resources, examples, and tips for each area and level, and there is a one-page table for quick visual reference. Our 14-person project team followed a highly collaborative, open, and iterative process where we engaged a diverse audience during the drafting process to ensure that the document would be broadly relevant. The levels are readily implementable. They model a practical approach to access that empowers practitioners to start where they are, strive for gradual improvement, and measure their progress as they move forward. We wrote them to be widely applicable, and they are intended to be an open resource that others can interpret, reconfigure, and adapt to meet their own needs. Preservation without access is pointless, and to this end, we believe that the levels make a lasting contribution to the field. With this resource, Archives are better equipped to facilitate access to born digital archival material, thereby fulfilling a key goal of digital preservation. And before closing, we'd like to quickly acknowledge our amazing teammates and their role in bringing the levels to fruition. And you can find the levels online at bit.ly slash bdlevels, and we are honored to be among the finalists. We congratulate all others across categories and wish everyone luck. Uh, thank you and take care. Diagram the Digital Archiving Graphic Risk Assessment Model, 
operated by the Safeguarding the Nation's Digital Memory Project. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm David Underdown, uh, not Alex Green, and was, as was originally billed. Um, I'm a, one of the senior digital archivists at National Archives in the UK. So here I'll just be giving a very quick three minute overview of kind of the what, why and how of uh, this particular project. Um, I particularly got involved because once, once upon a time I did a, a master's degree at Imperial College London. So I had some more of the, the background to help uh, get into this. So what is it? Um, formally, there's a, a Bayesian network behind it, uh, so lots of statistics, and we have a, a decision decision support tool uh, over that. So um, the network looks something like this. We have a, a series of risks all connected together uh, in, in different ways. So kind of the, the, the one that sticks out the most, the middle top is the, the kind of type of digital object, whether that's um, born digital, digitized, um, or, or surrogates, which has an impact on the file format, more file format has an impact on the tools we need to render it in the future, um, and combining with other things, how, how likely it is we'll be able to render, render that. Um, and then over the top of that uh, is what we've got an online decision support tool. Uh, the link is there. I will try and pop it in the chat as well. Um, so that the, the prototype is there for everyone to use. And with that, we get um, a view out, oh, missed, uh, a view out where we see, uh, you customize it to your own, own situation. There's kind of nine input questions. You can see your basic uh, risk, and then you can play around changing some of those risks. So if you could improve your technical skills, for example, how would that improve uh, your score, your risk score, and make it more likely to be pre preserving uh, your material. Why did we start on this? Um, there are quite a few, there are several existing qualitative models, but they don't allow you to compare uh, the different types of risk very easily. We needed evidence to demonstrate to funders and stakeholders the impact of uh, spending and to make the case for more, and for pre practitioners and stakeholders to make clearer the, the real complexities and the interlinking nature of the risks. Um, we're using it currently to support the National Archives' own submission for the UK government spending review. So we hope we'll be able to share that as a case study. Um, how we worked with statisticians from the University of Warwick. So these are knowledge and skills not previously employed in the digital archives. Also uh, five archives from across the UK or England, strictly speaking, um, who to bring in a good wide range of expertise. And we were fortunate to be supported in, in the project uh, by the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the UK and the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, who uh, with an Impact Acceleration Account Award uh, enabled Warwick to, to hire a, a research assistant specifically for this project. Uh, we also hired a, an additional research assistant uh, at the National Archives and the, the various archives uh, involved contributed um, people as experts to, to come together to help. And. Oxford Common File Layout, OCFL version 1. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the editorial group, which includes Andrew Hankinson, Neil Jeffries, Rosalind Metz, Julian Morley, Andrew Woods, and myself, Simeon Warner. So, OCFL is, apart from a difficult to say acronym, it is an open community effort to define an application independent way of storing versioned digital objects for long term preservation. The origin story is briefly some discussions in 2017 among repository architects about the layout and characteristics for repository storage that would transcend the short time span of particular software implementations and also changes in storage methodology. There was a much larger initial community meeting, which is where I got involved, and then an effort to sort of collect use cases, best practices, and come to some recommendations. An editorial group that I've named took this forward with regular community meetings and an open process on GitHub. I'll acknowledge at this point significant design influences from the Library of Congress Bagot format frequently used for transport and the Stanford University Moab experience, uh, but they're discussed elsewhere. I want to focus my time on five key requirements that OCFL meets. One is completeness, so the repository can be rebuilt from the files it stores. An OCFL object has the complete intellectual object so content stored together with its metadata. This falls in line with many existing standards, which typically define what you should do, whereas OCFL provides one version of how to do that. 
This model also allows good mapping from one system to another. Second is parsability, both by humans and by machines, to ensure that content can be understood in the absence of original software. In the ultimate disaster recovery limit, this means humans might need to understand it. So there's the file system metaphor and JSON documents, which are understandable, but more frequently relevant is the idea of machine readability so that simple applications can work on top of OCFL content. Third is robustness against errors, corruption, and migration between technologies. Strong fixity is baked in. Ob objects can easily be validated using the inventory and they can be completely self-contained. The fourth requirement is versioning so that we can make changes to repository objects while persisting their history. Within OCFL, the entire history can be reconstructed for each stage of a transition, but the content for any particular version is immutable once written. Forward delta versioning, only writing files that have changed reduces the amount of storage while still permitting, say, a workflow where such as delayed description where you upload the content and then do the description later. Finally, the fifth requirement is storage diversity to ensure that content can be stored on diverse storage infrastructures, including cloud object stores. OCFL supports the conventional file system metaphor, but is designed to work with either conventional file systems or on object store APIs. It also has the notion of deduplicating content, lowering overall storage costs. So where did this get us? There was an initial draft release in 2018 and the version 1.0 was released this summer. It comprises a specification and some implementation notes talking about how to meet the various requirements in practical situations. There are now validation and manipulation tools implemented in multiple programming languages and these range from standalone tools that might be operated on for the command line or built into some custom system through the development of the Fedora 6 repository, which is using OCFL as the persistence layer. I know I say this every time, but goodness me, uh, each one of those finalists is absolutely super and absolutely deserves their place as a finalist for the Digital Preservation Awards. You were both involved in the judging process for this category, weren't you? Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Could you reflect on the process for me? So this was my first time as a judge for the Digital Preservation Awards, and it's been a really positive experience. Getting to know the other judges and having robust discussions about digital preservation and innovation in this space was really interesting. The calibre of the nominees in the research and innovation category made selecting a winner very difficult indeed. But as I said, it did lead to some really rigorous discussions and this was even before we heard from the nominees themselves. It was, I was really impressed by the projects, but I was also um, impressed by the obvious passion that came across uh, the computer screens during presentations. This was a really exciting category to judge with a very high quality of nominations, which showcased collaboration between fields. We found it really hard to decide between very different finalists who brought something innovative to the category and we're so excited to share the winner with you on Thursday. So thank you to the finalists, thank you judges. We will be revealing the winners on World Digital Preservation Day, that's this Thursday the 5th of November at 12 o'clock, 12 noon UK time and you can watch live on the DPC website at dpconline.org forward slash events forward slash digital hyphen preservation hyphen awards. Look forward to seeing you then.